Hi, my name's Scott, the Miniature Maniac, and today we're working on some giant robots. Hey, sorry, quick interruption. I want to start teaching physical classes. In order to make the best class experience possible, I need your advice. So there's a survey in the description that I'd love to hear your opinion on. All right, that's all. Back to the video. What up, Mini Family? Today, I'm joined by a guest, Todd Thyberg, or better known as Mr. Robato Bato on Instagram. And Todd works on model kits. And there are a lot of similarities between model kits and the miniatures we use for our war games. But there are also some differences. What are the biggest differences, Todd? The main difference that I would say is just the scale. Um, I'm older, my hands shake, my eyes are bad. <laughs> It's, I can't paint a 28 millimeter figure. So these are something that I feel like I can really enjoy. Okay. Today we're working on the Mechatro WeGo kit and Todd picked it out. And Todd, maybe you can say why you picked this kit. I like this kit because it's a good introduction. A, it's inexpensive and you get two of these kits in the, in a box. Nice. And um, it's also not a huge stretch for you um, because it is like a large figure size versus some of the model kits that I make, which are quite large. Right, yeah, so you might have a boat that's like hundreds of hundreds of pieces. This is more like, what, 50 or 60 pieces? Exactly, you can build it in probably an hour and a half, two hours, okay. um, it's, it's, it's pretty quick. All right, cool. Now one of the first things that we are going to do that is a fun, unique process to model kit making is greebing. And Todd, maybe you can explain the difference between greebing by showing the difference between this vanilla arm that I have assembled for my kit and yours, which is a little bit different. Uh, what I've did is I've greebed or basically added on some extra pieces to give it some more interest and basically to tell sort of the story that I want to with it. And greebing comes from the movie making industry where they basically, to build spaceships, use polystyrene and bust up model kits and um, glue them together for all the detail you need for something to be realistic looking. Okay, cool. So the agenda for today's video is we are going to start with some greebing. I'm gonna work on a little bit of cabling on my arm. Todd's gonna to do something else. And then we're gonna move into the painting. And the question we're gonna to answer today is, if you're a miniature painter, how do you get into the model kit community? What are some considerations you need to think about? Some tools and techniques you might wanna research, but we'll start with greebing first. So for today, my plan is, is to use some guitar string and some extra styrene to add some cabling detail to my guy's arm. And what's your plan for today? My plan is to just do a little bit more greaming. I got some done ahead of time. Mm. I came up with a story where I want this guy to be basically doing some self-diagnosis. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tip back his head or completely remove it. And I've built a brain in there. And then also like a little sensor or like welder that's just made from- Is that scratch bill? This is totally scratch built. That's awesome. Thank you. So me and Tyler are gonna get started on that. We'll be just answering questions about model kit making in the process. He brought a, a whole box of greebs for me to uh, pillage from. So we'll get started on that. The one difference that I noticed about model kits when I was assembling this figure was just how amazingly the sprues are put together. So in this kit, each sprue is color coded and given a number. There was like A and B and E and D and PC and stuff like that. And each one had its own color. And then in the guidebook, it tells you the exact part and letter to use for each step. And for miniatures, you don't really ever get that nice of a setup. There, there are more pieces than a typical miniature, right? A miniature might be composed of three to five pieces. Yeah. And this is like 50, um, but they really have it laid out really nicely. And there's certain there's certain brands that as you um, as you get into kit building you you either um, avoid or find yourself um, uh, sort of flocking to. Okay. For instance, Bandai makes amazing kits. Okay. You can virtually snap them together, like a big Gundam that's uh, maybe a foot tall, like a like a perfect grade. You can snap that entire thing together, and it'll look gorgeous. You won't have big voids where uh, parts don't don't meet very well. The engineering is phenomenal. That's good. 
Okay, so Bandai is one of your favorite ones. Are there other ones that you like or are there ones that you know to avoid? Hasegawa is a really good one as well. And they make, um, I get a lot of Hasegawa parts for, for my Greebs, but they make, really, they make some really good sci-fi kits. The opposite end of the spectrum from the Bandai would be more garage kits where they're resin cast by uh, maybe in just an individual or a small company. Those you really have to um, do a lot of clipping on, a lot of filing, a lot of pinning in order to get them to uh, assemble well. Mm. It's a challenge, but one of the um, the benefits is that you're getting a kit that's just you know that that's kind of rare. You don't see it very much. Mm, okay. The other big difference that I noticed between figure painters and model builders is that I'm really doing what's called like hard surface, you know, so it's basically mostly metal stuff, robots or spaceships, whereas mm. with figures you're working with skins and fabrics and so that's soft surface. Okay, so model kits tend toward more of the manufactured material and less the, the natural material. Yes. All right, we've finished the greebing process, and now we're gonna move on to the undercoating process. And for the most part, the specific primers we use are pretty similar, uh, but in terms of how we're holding on to the individual bits, I'm using poster tack and pieces of wood, and you're using something a little bit different. Maybe you can explain that, Todd. Sure, when you're making a kit, you generally try and shoot it in sub-assembly. So like here, I've got the body. So it's nice, these alligator clips on sticks hold them. You can get distance from you and still access to mm. all the different parts. Nice. And you're kind of stabbing into some corrugated cardboard down here? Yeah, this is just something weird that I found. I can't remember what this came with. Okay. But another thing that works real well are those cat scratch pads. They're just kind of low low profile and you can fit a dozen a dozens of these sticks in. Okay, awesome. All right, so we'll get to undercoating and then we'll come back for some paint application. We'll do that off camera because we're gonna go outside and use an aerosol primer. All right, so we finished undercoating the model. If you're curious, we used Rust-Oleum gray primer and now we're gonna start base coating. Now, Typically in model kit making, you'll see a lot of airbrush use, but for logistical reasons, we're just gonna stick to using paintbrushes today. Um, I'm gonna use my scale 75 paint to lay down some base coats, but you're using uh, a little bit of a different brand. Which one are you using? I'm using the Tamiya. It's a flat, it's a acrylic. It's really nice, great coverage, but I just don't have as much sort of experience with, with paints as you do. I've typically used Vallejo or mm -hmm. Tamiya and that's it. Yeah, I mean, those are some big popular ones. Um, I know the thinner for Tamiya has like some alcohol in it. So does the paint itself have a little bit of alcohol in it? It must. I find it, it's something weird when I'm working with my airbrush and I'm using a Vallejo paint. And then if I put the uh, Tamiya paintbrush cleaner in it, it does something to the paint, like it kind of like makes little clumps or okay. cottage cheeses up on me. <laughs> okay. So this model kit has some articulating arms. What I would do if I was doing this in isolation would be to glue them down into a static pose and then prime it um, and then paint it just to make sure that I didn't forget about like painting any particular area um, that would be visible in one angle and not visible in another. Um, but you chose to paint them with the articulation still in place, and I'm curious why that is. I don't know if I necessarily have a good answer. I guess I sort of wait until the final, like I have an idea of where I want to go with the pose. Okay. But I may not have it quite yet. Okay. And so I don't want to like restrict myself and get it locked down and then find out that I've done it wrong. That makes sense. So you might have like a display base that isn't built yet, perhaps, and you want to fit this into the display base later on. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. So I've seen on your Instagram, Todd, that you've painted a lot of different model kits, and I was curious if you have a particular favorite one or a fun story behind one of them. I really like uh, the MAK, which I mentioned earlier, the, the Machine and Krieger. They're just a the stylistically they really resonate with me so i did one where i had envisioned it on a as sort of like a um watchdog in a like a northern climate sort of like on the coast of of scotland say it's really the first one that i've put on a base so i made uh, pebbles and rocks from super sculpey and baked those put those on the um on the base 
the pilot is standing next to it, so it's it's open. Um, the, it's basically an armored suit. If I was looking to get into the model kit world, are there particular kits that are like easier on people? Maybe not so many pieces, or not so complicated. I would say yes. The this is a really good one. The Mechatro We Go. It's it's small. You get two in a box. Uh, Bandai, as I mentioned earlier, are so easy to assemble. And they've started this new series. So this is like a little Star Destroyer that I recently received as a gift. These are like $7. Nice. Oh, it's already broken. Um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> there aren't only Star Wars ones, too. There are Star Trek model kits. There are Battlestar Galactica model kits. So they really do have all kinds of awesome sci-fi stuff. Yeah, definitely. The more recent the model kit is, the better. Like, you could get a... A Hasegawa from maybe like the 80s or 90s and struggle with it versus something from today okay. um, just because they've you know made inroads in their mold technology and everything is there any particular kinds of kits you might avoid for a beginner if you're just getting into it yeah I would say certainly avoid uh, the, the garage kits as much as stylistically they have something that you want they're real. They can be really hard to assemble. Instructions can be terrible. Sometimes they're just a photocopied sheet. Sometimes you don't even get any. So you watch miniature painters online, and you're a model kit painter yourself. And I'm curious if you've noticed a particular difference in like the general process that one might take when they are approaching a miniature versus approaching a model kit. So I think the the reason that that model building appeals to me more so, I think, is that you've got these different steps and for me like it's it's the grieving that's that's a lot of fun okay. um it's the decals it's adding all the the details at the end like with the weathering so that's kind of what what model building gives you is the opportunity to sort of spend your time focusing on either what you do best what you enjoy the most mm. and um still get something that you can be proud of and that looks really cool when you're done all right, we've finished doing our base coats. And now the next thing we're gonna start working on is putting down some decals. But before we do that, we need to apply a layer of varnish. So we're gonna go outside and put down some testers dill coat and be right back for some decal work. So the varnish has dried and now we're gonna do some decal work as previously mentioned. And Todd busted out this awesome little case of just tons and tons of decals that he's collected over a period of how many? Years. Year and a half. Year and a half. So not mm -hmm. not that long. Okay, and you can collect this many out of all the boxes that you buy, possibly? Easily. I bought some specifically on eBay. Oh, okay. So these are like from some old kits. They have a little, they're a little bit yellow. They don't work the greatest, but they're also really cool because they're just something that you don't see. Okay. Um, they're from like World War One airplanes or something. Gotcha. Okay. We have our decals picked out. So now I'm going to fill a little container with some water, uh, not too deep. And we're going to start to soften these decals so we can apply them to our robot arms. Different cals take different amount of, of time to uh, loosen up. Some manufacturers are different than others. If the water's warm versus cool, that can make a difference. Oh, okay. And it's pretty crucial to do it after the varnish. And that's because the softener can start to lift the paint. Is that why? Yeah, you can you can start to activate the paint. What I use is the um, the Mr. Mark Setter and Mr. Mark Softener. It's a two-part thing. Basically, I use uh, the Mr. Mark Setter, uh, put that on the model kit, use the tweezers, get the decal off onto your uh, part. You'll dab it with a Q-tip get rid of the extra moisture and then put some, another coat of the Mr. Mark setter on there and that helps soften it and or help, helps it to just kind of to stick to the part. Okay. Once that's completely dry then you go through with the Mr. Mark softener and, and hit it with that and then that's like the final coat. If it's sticking too much just put a little more water down because um, it'll float on that. Oh you're right okay that lifted it right back up okay that's nice. It sounds counterintuitive too, like that we're using the setter for the first one. Yeah. So I found a YouTube video where somebody is using this first and that second. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing it wrong, maybe someone will point it out in the comments. Oh, you bet your butt. Well. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
There's no shortage of <laughs> keyboard warriors on YouTube. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So after applying the setter and letting it dry, the next step is then to apply another layer of varnish over top of it to protect the decal from the next step, which is going to be weathering. So I'm gonna take the same varnish we used in the previous step and apply it again and be right back. All right, our varnish on top of our decals has dried and now we're going to start to do some weathering. And we're going to start with doing some chipping of paint. And the primary way we're going to do that is by applying some silver paint with a little sponge uh, to various corners and edges that would receive the most wear. Um, I'm going to do it in a slightly different way than you're doing it. I'm going to start with black paint, go a little bit heavier handed with the chipping, and then paint inside of the black chips with silver nice. paint. Okay. Yep. Just to kind of show like two layers of paint being removed. Yeah, yeah, the top coat, then the, like the black primer, presumably, then like the silver under part. I like that. You might notice that the base coats that me and Todd applied weren't the most opaque base coats. And part of the reason why we can kind of take a little bit more liberty, you know, not going so hardcore with the opacity is that we're gonna do this weathering step and this weathering step is gonna kind of hide a lot of our crimes. You know, one thing that I'm kind of realizing through this entire process is that this painting process is extremely less pedantic than painting a miniature. I know that model kits can be kind of arduous if you want to make it uh, arduous. Um, but because this, this is kind of like a newer thing to me, I'm kind of just blissfully ignorant of all the things that I'm doing wrong and I'm just having fun. <laughs> so I might encourage you if you're a miniature painter and you feel like all the stuff you've been painting recently is kind of a drag, like just give this a shot because there is freedom in kind of being bad at something. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna to start to do some washing. And this is something that I've been investigating in some of my recent videos, if you've watched them, using oil washes, which is very much so a model kit thing. So what did you bring with you today to, to test out? Uh, so I brought, these are some uh, weathering effects that I, I got when I first got into the hobby. They're by Vallejo. I've got like a streaking grime, an engine grime, and a fuel stain. They're really nice, they're pre-mixed, but it was more recently, probably within the last six months that I really got into using oils. And I really like them because you can not only obtain, like you can mix those and make your own washes. Mm -hmm. Because of their opacity, you can use them as like dust effects mm. as well. Um, they're just, they're really great. Um, but for, for today's purposes, I thought I would use, um, the Vallejos. Okay, and these are actually acrylic washes. They are. They're not They're not the oil ones, but they do give you a nice weathered look. So for my uh, guy, I'm gonna use some oil washes. I'm gonna take some uh, just cheap Blick oil uh, paints and mix them with some mineral spirits or uh, white spirit, and then wash it into all of the crevices because all these panel lines are begging to get some nice definition. So I'm using a synthetic brush right now to apply my oil wash. And man, that is just straight up magic. That is so much better than an acrylic wash. And this is gonna be one of the last steps that we do because uh, oil products can typically take kind of a long time to, to dry. If you're not familiar with mixing your own oil washes, the trick that I kind of learned is that you can add as much white spirit as you want until the pigment in the oil paint starts to separate from the binder. And you can find that out by pulling the wash up on the side of the, the utensil or, or cup uh, you're using. And then if it splits a moment later, that means you're too watered down and you need to add more oil paint. Another gotcha about using oil washes that you can't use water to clean out oil. Uh, you need to use more white spirits. So I have another little container here of white spirits that I'm using to rinse my synthetic brush out. All right, now I'm gonna see if I can get some more streaks going here and less panel lining. And so what I'll do is I'll apply some straight up oil paint uh, and feather it out with a clean, softer brush. Yeah, so that was probably too much, and I'll get some 
mineral spirits and maybe wipe some of it away. Todd, can you tell me some of the advantages of using oil washes versus acrylic washes? The big one for me is um, working time. I also feel like there's, like they're just a little bit, a little bit stickier, more viscous, and so I feel like I have more control there. And when you say working time, what does that really mean? How how long do I have to to mess around with these oil washes and change them and whatnot? I'd say even like a matter of. A couple of days because you can you can sort of reconstitute it with the with the white spirits and and still move it around because of its you know like the the, the oil nature versus like the, the water acrylics um, kind of once those dry you're pretty much done right well, that's gonna do it for this one guys big thanks to Todd for coming over and showing us the ropes allowing us to get our feet wet in the world of the model kit. If you guys are interested in some tools that we used over the course of this video and also some beginner model kits, you can find them linked in the description below. If you wanna find out more about what Todd does and the work that he does with model kits, go follow him on Instagram at Mr. Roboto Bato. But more importantly than that, don't forget, most importantly, to my metal.